Right, I've put together some more review questions and in this section of questions we're going to cover forward rate agreements, options and swaps. We're just going to look at the relationship of a forward curve to a swap curve. What I want you to understand is where swap rates actually come from. Well, we'll kick off looking at FRAs and forward forwards because this almost always comes up in the ACI exams. Now the key thing to remember is you've got a formula sheet so go through the formula sheet and make sure you know how it works and that you're up to speed with the calculations and how your calculator works. Now before we look at forward rates agreements we've got to figure out how a forward rates calculated. Now I've got an example here where we know our 12 month rate is 3.06 percent and we know our six month rate is 2.54 percent. And knowing those two numbers, that will allow me to mathematically work out the six month rate in six months time. Now it would be written down like this, six times 12, which is called in the dealing of your six is 12s. So the six is 12 is a period starting six months from today, ending 12 months from today. We're isolating that block of time. So what I'm going to do is work out what that 6 plus 12 interest rate is, is according to the calculations. And again, this is on the formula in the ACI sheet. Now I've followed the formula down on the left hand side here. And what it says, really simple, is make sure you know the day count of the currency involved and write down 1 plus the interest rate of the longer period, which is the 12 month period at 306 times actual number of days over 360 and on the bottom write down 1 plus the interest rate for the shorter period which we know is 254 for 6 months times again actual over 360 so divide the long rate by the bottom rate once you've done that subtract 1 really important you do that what we're then going to do is multiply it by 360 gross it up to a full year 360 day year and divide it by 183 well where does the 183 come from well, the first half of the year apparently has 182 days, so the second six month period must have, assuming it's not a leap year, 183 days. Now we get this number here, 3.53%. What it means is it doesn't matter what you do with your money, whether you hold it for a full year at 3.06% or have it in the bank for six months at 254 and for another six months at 353. Both routes will give you the same cash at the end of the year. It's what they call an arbitrage free number. Doesn't matter what you do with your money. So that's mathematically how we would calculate a forward rate. Now you might see that number and say, I think it's too high or I think it's too low. Fine, but mathematically that's what it has to be. And if you do think it's too high or too low, do something about it. Do an interest rate future, do an FRA, whatever you want. So at the bottom here, I've got the formula as you'll see it on the ACI sheet. You can take that into the exam with you. And what I want you to do to just see if you've got the concept here is I've written down the questions. On the left hand side, I've got a question involving Arab, Arab dirhams. So dirhams with EBOR is actual 360 day count. And on the right, I've got Aussie dollars, domestic Aussie dollars using actual 365 day count. Now remember, uh, if, if I look at it like this, use the formula at the bottom of the page. Remember the long interest rate goes on the top, the short interest rate goes on the bottom. You've got the number of days in each period. You've got the day count. So what I want you to do is work out the sixes, nines, which would be the three month period starting six months from today, ending nine months from today. And on the right hand side with the Aussie dollar example, work out the threes, nines. And you can work out the number of days between these periods because on the first one, it's simply the difference between 271 days and 182 days. And likewise on the Aussie dollars, the difference between 272 days and 91 days. So you've got all the information to work it out. I promise you one of these questions highly likely to come up. So make sure this formula is second nature to you. Okay, what you could do now is put me on pause. I'm about to show you what the answers are. So for the first one, we've got 271. So as you saw, we had the long interest rate at the, on the top end, 258, and the shorter maturity interest rate on the bottom, 250. And we get 271. And for the Aussie dollar, 
we get a 384. Now, look at the Aussie dollars. Does the number look right? Well, if the three month rate is 350 and the nine month rate is 375, intuitively, you should feel in a positive yield curve, the forward rate is going to be higher than the spot rate. So 384 feels like it's the correct sort of number we're looking for. So again, use your common sense. If you got 1%, couldn't be. If you got 5%, highly unlikely. So 384 feels like the right number. Always do a reality check. Also on the formula sheet is the buyout for or the net settlement for a forward rate agreement or a FRA. So again, use, use the formula. Let's put it into practice. You bought a 10 million euro three sixes FRA at one and a half percent. Okay, let's stop there. If you've bought an FRA, what are you going to do? Why would you do that? If you're a borrower and you're worried about interest rates going up, you buy an FRA. So a borrower buys and if interest rates settle at a higher rate, you're compensated. If you're a saver, you're worried about interest rates going down. So a saver sells an FRA. So if interest rates go down, you're compensated. Now here you've bought a, a 360 far at 150. So if a settlement interest rates are higher than 150, you're going to be compensated. What happens? Yep, sure enough, rates do settle higher than 150. So you know you're going to be compensated the difference between 177 and 150. For how long? Well, for the 90 day period that is involved in this 360 far. So if you know you're going to be compensated, look at the answers. You know it can't be answer C, you know it can't be answer D because there you're paying out. You know it's got to be A or B. So let's just take a look. What's the answer? The answer is A, but why do we get to that number? Using the formula on the FRA settlement amount, the number we're going to get is going to be the notional principal, 10 million euros, times the settlement rate and the FRA rate, so the difference between 177 and 150 times 90 over 360. And this is the important bit, discounted back to a present value. So let's put numbers on this. So here we've got 10 million euros times 0.27, the difference between the FRA rate 150 and where it's settled times 90 over 360. So the top line works out to 6,750 euros. Now what the bank will say is, look, we know how much money we're going to pay you in 90 days time. Why wait 90 days? Let's just give you the money now. Oh, and by the way, 6,750 euros in 90 days time is not the same as 6,750 euros today. So we need to discount it from a future value in 90 days time back to today to a present value. How do you do that? You divide it by 1 plus the interest rate for this period, which we know is 1.77%. We're just discounting it back over 90 days, over 360 because it's euros. So this, this bottom line here, if, if you like, acts as your discounting function. Now this is where you need to know how your calculator works, how to store these numbers in the memory using the STO or store button, then recalling them to divide one line by the other. Anyhow, the net result. 6,720 euros is your compensation. Does the number look right? Yeah, it feels right. Where do we apply FRAs? Again, this is where you might want to have a pen and pencil or, and paper just to draw out what's going on. It says if a client has a six month dollar asset and a three month dollar liability, how could he hedge his balance sheet exposure in the FRA market? Okay, remember, an asset for a bank is a loan. So when banks make loans, that's an asset that's going to generate income. So what the bank or the client has done here is it's putting on the books a six-month loan. Now let's say it's put a six-month loan on which pays a return of 5%. It's funded it for the first three months. In other words, it's got money for the first three months to cover the loan and it's put on a three month deposit. But of course, the trouble is in three months time, that deposit will fall due. And you'll have to get another deposit in. And in three months time, interest rates could have gone up, could have gone down. What he's worried about is if interest rates have gone up in three months time and have gone up above 5%, then he's paying out more on his deposit than he's earning on his loan. So his risk is in three months time, the three month rate will be higher than what he's receiving on his asset. 
So if you're worried about rate interest rates going up like a borrower, a borrower buys to protect himself. So the answer can't be B, can't be D. Now he's worried about the period starting three months from today, ending six months from today. That's the period that's unhedged. So the answer has to be A. He's going to buy three sixes for R. If you look at it on a drawing, on the top line here, I've got this is a six month interest coming in on his asset on the loan he's made, funded for the first few months with liability. However, if interest rates go up for the second three month period, that's when the period is at risk or interest rate income is at risk. So that's the period you want protection in case rates rise. So this is why you're buying a period of three sixes in the FRA market. You saw how I drew out the lines for the deposits and the uh, liabilities and the assets and the, or the loans. Think of it in these terms. A bank borrowing dollars for 12 months and lending them for six months creates what? Well, if you're borrowing do uh, dollars for 12 months, you put on a 12 month dollar deposit. You've lent them for six months, so you, you have a home for the money for the first six months, but you don't know what you're going to do with the money for the next six months. So your deposit is a longer maturity than the loan you've created. So net, you've got a forward, forward deposit. Let's put that onto a drawing. So on the top line, this is our liability, our deposit that we've got on the books for 12 months. We know where we're going to lend out the money for the first six months, but for the next six months, we don't know what we're going to do with the money. And the risk we run is that if interest rates go down in six months time, we're not going to make as much money on our loan that we're extending through our balance sheet as we're paying out on the deposit we took. Okay, it's June. You're overborrowed from October to January on your deposit book. How would you hedge using FRAs? Well, first of all, let's just look at the period of time involved here. If it's June, we're talking about October to January. So June, July, August, September, October. That's four months away. So we're just talking about the period starting four months from today, ending seven months from today, from October to January, if today is June. So June, July, August, September, October, that's four months. So we know the answer can't be A, can't be B, because they're talking about three months from today. Now, if you're overborrowed, what you've done is you've borrowed more money than you need. So you better hope that in in four months time, interest rates have moved your way. If you borrowed too much money, you better hope interest rates have gone up. If they don't, you've got a problem. If interest rates go down, you're going to lose money. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell a false sevens for R. So if interest rates go down, the FRA will compensate us, and make up for the fact we're not earning so much money on the deposit we've taken. So this is what I've drawn here. So it says we're here in June. That's T0. We're looking at the period of starting four months from today, ending seven months from today. So the three month period starting in four months time are four sevens. Now what we're worried about is the gap here. So what we're concerned is that if interest rates go down, we're not going to earn enough money to cover what we're paying out on the deposit that we took because we overstretched our balance sheet. OK, changing tack now from interest rates, let's just have a quick look at an FX swap. We're going to look at an FX swap, which is anti spot. If you remember, anti is the Latin for before. So this is for a maturity before spot. And so if you remember before spot, what do we do with the point? change sides, change signs. Now the numbers here look pretty intimidating at first. Don't worry about the numbers. We've got spot Euro Noki or Euro against Norwegian, where it says here for one Euro, you get so many Norwegian Krona. We've got the swap points for overnight, Tom next and spot next. Now it says here, at what rate can you sell Euros against Norwegian Krona for value tomorrow? Well, first of all, you can put me on pause, work it out yourself. 
but let me take you through the answer here. You can see that if we're going to be selling euros for value tomorrow, these are the rates that you are quoted. So if you're quoted these points, you're the swap taker, you're the price taker, not the price maker. So if you want to sell euros, the other bank says, OK, I will bid the euros off you on the left hand side. I will bid the euros off you. And for every euro I bid off you, I will give you 7.525 krona. So really important to read that. You are the price taker because you are quoted, you're not you're doing the quoting, you are quoted the rates. So you'll deal at the other bank's left hand side, their bid side, where they bid a euro off you. And for every euro they bid off you, they will give you 7.525 krona. Now we're talking about for value tomorrow, so we're going to look at the Tom next points here. Now, because it's before spot or anti spot, what are we going to do with these points? Swap sides and swap signs. So 312 to 322 now goes to 322, 312. We're going from a high number on the left, 322, to a low number on the right. So, what are we going to do with the points? We're going to subtract them. So, on the left hand side, from 7.525, spot I'm going to subtract 3.22 Norwegian krona points so this is the number of Norwegian krona I'm going to get for value tomorrow so for every euro the other bank bids off me they'll give me 7.524678 so remember anti spot swap sides swap signs I want to discuss a conceptual point as well of where swap rates come from. I'm often asked this when I train up relationship bankers uh, as well as some of the guys in the dealing room because they'll see a swap rate of 3.25% or 4.25. Why 4.25? Why not 4.8 or 3.6? Where does the swap rate come from? And it's really important to understand this. And when you're dealing with clients and you're trying to give them a hedging strategy, you need to be able to understand this as well because their view on a forward curve will dictate what, whether they do a swap or an option or leave it unhedged. I, I found a nice positive yield curve from, from a, a two or three years ago, which I thought I'd use again because it demonstrates the point really, really well. Now, what this shows in, in blue is the implied forward curve. So it shows you at the time, this is back in June 2020, where floating rates were at the time. Uh, on uh, probably dollar LIBOR at the time. Every three months, based on the dollar LIBOR futures contract, you could see where the market anticipated three month LIBOR rates going all the way out to 10 years. And it's laughable now when, we, when you see them implying the 10 year rate was going to be 1.2% given what we know now. But this is what the market thought. So every three months, this is what the market thought LIBOR was going to be. Now in a swap, what are we doing? We're saying to a client, for example, in an interest rate swap, I will pay the LIBOR rate, whatever the floating rate is, whether it's 1% or 10%, and in return, I want to swap it, and you'll give me a single fixed rate in return. Where's that fixed rate gonna be? The golden rule of derivatives is a present value of what I pay you should equal the present value of what you pay me. So basically, the bank at the time would look at where it thought floating rates were going to go to, and in return, it would ask for a single fixed rate, which, as you can see, is pretty much the average of where it expects floating rates to go. So at the end of 10 years, whether you paid floating or fixed should make no difference. Sometimes the fixed rate or the swap rate is higher than the floating rate. Sometimes it's lower. It's the weighted average. So as far as we're concerned, what we would do with the client is this. Here's your client with a floating rate loan. We say whatever that floating interest rate is, we've got you covered and in return you pay us a fixed rate. Now again, present value is the key to everything we do in the swap markets. This is goes to whether you're valuing up bonds or swaps, it's really important. Now looking at the forward curve, I can see what the market thinks floating rates are gonna be over the next five, seven, 10 years, whatever maturity you're looking at. What we do is we discount these floating cash flows back to a present value. We can see a lump up front, if you like, of all the floating rate payments we think we're going to make over the next, say, 10 years. 
What I want the client to do in return is to pay me a single fixed rate. And I need to set that fixed rate at such level such that the present value of the fixed rate that I'm being paid equals the present value of the floating rate that I think I will be paying out in return. So the PV in should equal the PV out. How do I make my money? I just adjust the swap rate so that I receive a little bit more, so that the present value of what I receive is bigger than the present value of what I pay. Now a question I had when I started in the dealing room was, look, this is all very well, but what if the floating rate doesn't end up being where you thought it would be? Uh, you know, basically what we've seen over the past two or three years. It doesn't matter because on the day we do the swap, we'll hedge the floating rates using financial futures. So if in three years time interest rates have gone up to 15%, don't worry, I'll pay 15% out to the client, but don't worry about me. I'm receiving 15% on my hedge because I've locked it in with a future or a FRA or some other instrument. So present value of what I receive should equal the present value of what I pay. So this is where swap rates come from. They're the weighted average of where we think floating rates are going to go. So if I look at an IO, a SOFA curve for dollars or a Eurobor curve for euros, I can see roughly what the mid rate should be. The middle, you know, the average rate should be weighted for time. So have a look at this. The blue line represents what the market thinks floating rates are going to do. And based on that, we've got the red line, which is a swap rate, which is a weighted average of the blue line. What if your view is different? What if you believe interest rates will go up according to the green line? So rates will go up, but not as fast as the, float, as the blue floating rates. Well, what you're saying is, I think the yield curve is too steep. I don't think interest rates will go up that high. So if I think the blue line is too high, I'm saying the swap rate is also too high. So why pay fixed if you're paying a higher fixed rate than you think you should be paying? Stay floating and maybe do a cap or some other interest instrument which will protect you, but which allows you to take advantage of rates staying low. But you wouldn't want to swap if this is your view. So what I would do is I'd sit down with the client, show them the forward curve, give them a pen and say, what do you think rates are going to do? Typically, I'd say this is what we think the rates are going to do, but what do you think is going to happen? Okay, let's just finish up with a couple of option points. And again, remember this is all about terminology. What does it mean if you have a position where you're short a dollar put and a yen call? Okay, first of all, if you're short, you've sold an option. You've earned premium by selling an option by giving somebody else the right to choose whether they exercise the option. So if you've gone short and sold, given somebody else the right to choose, it can't be answer A or can't be answer B. You have given the counterparty the right, but not the obligation to exercise the option. Now, when we talk about a dollar put, what have you done? You have given somebody else the right to sell you or put dollars to you. And in return for that, they're going to get yen. So. A dollar put, yen call, mean the same thing. They're handing over dollars with one side, receiving dollar, a yen with the others. So you have given your counterparty the right, but not the obligation to put yen or sell yen to you. And in return, if they're selling yen, they must be, sorry, selling dollars, they must be getting a currency in return, which in this case is yen. So just to be very clear, you've gone short. You have given somebody else the right to exercise the option. You have given them the right to put dollars or sell dollars to you. And if they're selling dollars to you, they must be getting something in return, which in this case is yen. Okay, couple more questions, then we're done. Consider that you set up a one month trading strategy with the following positions. You sell a Euro call dollar put strike 111 and a premium for a premium of $34 pips and you buy a euro put which is the same as a dollar call with a strike at 107 and that's going to cost you a premium of 26 pips. Now with euro dollar spot at expiry at 110.50 so $1.1050 to the euro what could be the maximum positive result in dollar pips that can be achieved by the strategy? Okay let's stop it sounds a bit complicated it's not if you have sold a euro call dollar put, what does that mean? That means that you have sold somebody the right to buy a euro off you 
for a price of $1.1150. So you have given, sold a euro call, somebody the right to call in or buy euros. And for every euro they buy, it's going to cost them $1.11. You've also bought a euro put dollar call at 107. So you have bought the right to sell a euro. And for every euro you sell, you're going to earn or receive $1.07. So what's your maximum amount of money or loss? Let's take a look. Well, the good news is you're going to earn eight pips. And I'll show you why. Take a look at the bottom here. Now let's start off with this option here, where you have sold somebody the right to buy a euro off you. And if they buy a euro off you, they're going to have to pay $1.11. Well, why would they pay $1.11 when at settlement Euro dollar is one ten fifty? But what that means is forget the option. If I want to buy a euro, I can just go to the market and it'll only cost me one dollar ten fifty to buy a euro, which is a lot better and cheaper than paying one eleven on the option. So you know what? I'm not going to exercise the option. What about the second option here? You buy a euro put dollar call at 107. So what does that, what does that mean? That means that you buy the right to sell or put a euro. And for every euro you sell, you're going to be able to buy a dollar. In fact, one dollar and seven cents. Would you do that? Well, no, you wouldn't. Because why sell a euro to earn one dollar and seven cents when you can earn one dollar ten fifty in the market? So that option is not going to get excised either, is it? So you sold an option, you earned 34 pips for it. You bought an option which cost you 26 pips. Subtract one from the other and you've got a nice profit of 8 pips. So just, you know, don't get phased by the terminology. Just use your common sense. Would you exercise the option or not? Okay, final question. Now, because this has sort of technical words, it looks intimidating. This is much easier than it looks. How would you delta hedge a deeply in the money short put option? So what have you done? If it's in the money, it's going to be very sensitive to movements in rates and you've gone short a put option. So you have gone short. You have sold somebody the right to sell a good to you at a particular price. You have gone short, you've sold an option. The option you sold is a put option. So if prices go down, they're probably going to exercise their option and sell whatever commodity is to you. So if prices go down, that's not good for you. So you need to do something which will reward you if prices go down. So what are you going to do? If you want to be rewarded against prices going down, you go short. So remember, if you go short, you win if prices go down. If you go long, you win if prices go up. And you're going to go short the underlying commodity equal to more than 50%. If an option is in the money, that means you'll have to sell or buy more than 50%. If it had been at the money, it would have been 50% exactly. So just to be very clear, you've hedged an in the money option. So you've gone more than 50%. You've gone short a put. You have sold somebody the right, an option, the, sold somebody the right to sell you goods. So if prices go down, they will exercise that option. That's not good for you. So you want to be rewarded if prices go down. That's why you have gone short a put option yourself. Okay, well, I hope this has helped. It's just a bit of a brief overview, just a reminder uh, of where your weaknesses may be. Uh, but go through this a couple of times before you sit the exam. And just remember, use the formula in the ACI sheet.